Okay, let's get started. Hi everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Calculating Your Pension. My name is Candace Jazak, and I'm a member of the mobilization team at the PIPS National Office in Ottawa. I'm joined today by John Starrett from our compensation team. John is our subject matter expert on your pension. Thanks for joining us today, John. My pleasure, and thank you everyone for signing on. So before we begin, we'd like to take some time to respectfully acknowledge that our office, located in the settlement now called Ottawa, is on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. Before this land was a city, it was and remains a place for the Algonquin Anishinaabe people whose presence here reaches back over 8,000 years. As settlers, it's our responsibility to educate ourselves on the history of the First Peoples, to learn how to be respectful of their cultures, to acknowledge their pain and our part in it. This journey of understanding is uncomfortable, but that discomfort is part of discovering our past and taking responsibility for how we continue to benefit from it. It is our duty to learn, grow, and do better. And I'm hopeful that our journey guides us to a respectful and harmonious future. Also at the beginning of our webinars, we'd like to provide you with our equity statement. And this clearly outlines our expectations from participants. If you could please take a moment to review the statement, the link is in the chat box now. As noted, the Professional Institute of the Public Service of Canada strives to create a climate that is respectful, safe, and inclusive, and where we all feel welcome and valued, and where we are supported to make our contribution and to support others to make theirs. We thank you for being a part of this inclusive space. And lastly, I'll go over a few things about our platform Zoom. So due to the size of the group today, we've muted everyone's computer to ensure we have the best sound quality for everyone participating and for those who will watch later. Please use the chat box to send us a message if you have any questions or technical issues during the webinar. My colleague Catherine is monitoring the chat box and will be able to help you out. And lastly, the session is being recorded and it will be circulated to everyone via email very soon. All right, the next piece is some feedback. So throughout today's session, we'll be asking you for your feedback on the webinar and on pension issues. These polls are completely anonymous and optional and your participation will help us make sure that we can continue to improve your webinar experience. And this helps us deliver better and more relevant content for all PIPS members. Our first three questions today are just to let us get to know you a little bit better. So you should see questions on your screen now. All right. Once again, your answers are anonymous and optional, and the results will not be shared with participants. The first question is, please identify your gender and please select all that apply to you. The second question is, please share your age. And the third question is, how many years of service do you have? And I should note that if you don't see the pop-up window, it is likely due to some settings on your computer that blocks pop-ups like that. You are welcome to share your responses in the chat if you'd like to participate, but I will note that responses in the chat are not anonymous. So I'll give you a little bit of time to respond to those. All right, give you about another 10 seconds. So if you haven't put in your response, please do so now. All right, thank you so much for your feedback and we will have more opportunities throughout the session. So let's get started with our agenda. Today, following a quick review of your pension plan and how it works, we'll take a look at how to calculate your pension benefit. We'll take a look at what we call our guideline and compare that to the actual calculation. We're going to go over some things you should consider when calculating your pension and connect you with the best resources for getting an accurate pension calculation. 
And before we dive into this agenda, it's important to note that this webinar is an overview of how to calculate your pension and designed to give you a general understanding. You should always review information on the Treasury Board's website and contact the Pension Center before making any major decisions related to your pension. And with that, let's get started with a quick review of your pension plan. For those that attended our introductory Understanding Your Pension Sessions last fall, this bit will be a bit familiar. If you haven't attended an introductory session, we encourage you to do so. We continue to offer these sessions regularly and recordings are available on our website. So John, could you please give us a quick overview of the Public Service Pension Plan? Sure, and welcome everyone for coming to this uh, session here. So all members invited to today's session are members of the Public Service Pension Plan, commonly referred to as the PSP. This is a defined benefit pension plan and most of our members are in defined benefit pension plans. So how it works. Over the course of your working career, both you and your employer make roughly equal contributions to the pension plan. Those funds are then invested and when you retire, your pension is paid by those investments from that pension fund. So your pension is essentially four savings on your part and the first salary on the part of the employer. Defined benefit pension plans like the public service pension plan are considered sort of the gold standard for workplace pensions. Is that right? Yes, that's absolutely right. With the defined benefit pension plan, your income at retirement is basically guaranteed. So when you retire, you will, you will receive a regular a determined annual income until you pass away. And uh, then there are provisions for your spouse uh, and dependents. And it's up to your employer to ensure that the pension fund is able to pay your retirement income. This means the employer, the, the government, takes on any risk associated with investments and market fluctuations, interest rates, et cetera, to make sure that the fund is um, fully funded to pay your pensions. Great. Now, sometimes we refer to group one and group two members when we're talking about the PSP. So let's just do a quick poll to see whether folks on today's webinar know which group they belong to. So you should see that poll on your screen now. Are you a member of group one or group two, or are you not sure? I'll give everyone a moment to answer that question. And I'll remind folks as well, if you don't see the pop-up, it could be because of your computer settings to block these sort of pop-ups. So you're welcome to share your responses in the chat if you'd like to participate. All right, I'll give everyone a few more seconds to respond. Okay, now let's take a look at those results. So you can see that the bulk of folks on today's call, about 66% are from group one. We have about 25% from group two and 9% that aren't sure. And I think that's uh, probably pretty common, um, even for folks who have said group one or group two, it's sometimes uh, not always clear to folks. John, could you remind us what group one and group two is referring to? Uh, yes, uh, group one refers to members who were hired on or before December 31st, 2012. And group two refers to members who were hired on January the 1st, 2013 and 13 or later. Uh, so both groups of members have the same pension plan. All the details and how the plan functions, et cetera, are the same for everyone. The key difference between the two groups is a normal retirement age. Uh, as you can see on your screen, for group one members, the normal retirement age is 60, and for group two is 65. And normal retirement age refers to the, plan, the pension plan's expected age for your retirement. So the PAL and the pension calculations are based on that age. And of course, that affects the early retirement age, as you can see on the screen. Uh, group one, five years prior, is age 55. If they have 30 years of service and for group two, you'd have to be 60 and have 30 years of service to re retire with an unreduced pension. And why did this change happen? <clears throat> so 
So back in 2011, um, the plan ratio, uh, the funding rate of the plan was split around 2872, meaning about 28% of the benefit was paid by the member and 72% was paid by the employer. Uh, the government at that time wanted to bring this closer to a 50-50 split, which is common in most other public service pension plans. In addition to this, uh, they said, well, if we're splitting it or increasing the contribution rate to make it 50-50, we're also going to create a group two because most pension plans have a normal retirement age of 65 and not 60. Um, but of course, having, having to work five years longer, uh, one of the good things about being in group two is that you contribute a little bit less, uh, roughly one to one and a half percent less for your pension. And that's because the contra that uh, period of contribution is a little bit longer, right? That's right, that's right. All right. So John, when your team is talking about calculating a member's pension benefit, you often refer to a guideline. Can you explain what that is? Uh, yes. So if you wanted to quickly write it on the back of a napkin and you know wanted to see what your pension would be, the simplified calculation, you know, to give you a ballpark for your benefit would be to take 2% of your best five consecutive average years of earnings. And uh, you would take that and you would multiply that by um, how many years of service you have. So if we take some round numbers, uh, you would, we take $100,000. Most members at the end of their career hopefully will be around that amount or more. So 2% of 100,000 is 2,000. And then you multiply it by how many years of service you have. So we just use 15 in this example. So 2% of 100,000 is 2,000. 2,000 times 15 is $30,000. Okay, well, that seems pretty straightforward, but we're calling it a guideline. So it sounds to me like this isn't the exact calculation. That's right. Uh, that's not the exact calculation. The exact calculation looks uh, more complicated, but it comes out to roughly the same thing. So as you can see on the screen here, uh, we first have to make a few definitions. Uh, AMPE is the average maximum pensionable earnings. YMPE is a year's maximum pensionable earnings. And uh, the year's maximum pensionable earnings is something that's created by CRA. And it basically represents the average wage for uh, Canadians in Canada. Uh, this year is 61,600. Last year, it was 58,700. Um, if you look at your pay stubs religiously, you would notice that uh, your QPP or CPP contributions stop when you hit this amount. And because your CPP or QPP contributions stop, you pay a little bit extra into your pension. And so this is why you have this two-tiered um, calculation. So you have 1.375, times the average salary up to that AMPE, up to a maximum of 35 years of service. In our example, we're using 15. And then above that uh, AMPE, we use 2% and you multiply that by the years of service. So again, in this example, 1.375 times 56,400 uh, would be a person who retired last year at December 31st, times 15 is 11,641. You add that to 2% of the 43,560, which is uh, 100,000 minus the 56,440. Multiply that by 15 and you get 13,068. And that gives you $24,709. Still not quite the 30,000 we had before. So we go to the next slide. So I think that's uh, where the Brennan, sorry, tongue tied, the bridge benefit comes in. How does that factor in here? So exactly, this is where the bridge benefit comes in uh, because the normal retirement age is 60 and uh, you normally you would start your CPP or QPP at 65. So the bridge benefit takes these members in group one from 60 to 65. And the bridge benefit is calculated as that difference between that the 2% and the 1.325%. 1 so you are ended up with 0.675, you multiply that by 56,440 by 15, and that gives you $5,291 for your bridge. 
And if you take what we had before, the 24,709 and add it to this bridge benefit, and you have 30,000, right? Uh, exactly as you did in that quick uh, calculation we had before. Okay, so the bridge benefit, it's essentially designed to mimic the CPP or the QPP if you live in Quebec until that normal retirement age for those programs. Is that right? Yes, exactly. So the, uh, the bridge benefit basically does just that. When you retire earlier than age 65, it bridges you uh, with no penalty to age 65. Uh, but members do have the option to uh, start their CPP or QPP at age 60 if they want to. Uh, but if they were, they would be penalized 7.2% um, per year. And so if you multiply that by five, it's 36%. So it's a significant penalty. And you would have that penalty for the rest of your life. So if you live till 95, uh, you would have that, uh, that reduction for the rest of your, your life. Uh, but the bridge ben benefit only goes to age 65 and it stops at age 65. And it's also only for group one members because for group two members, the normal retirement age is 65. All right, that all makes sense. So all of that aside, if we're comfortable with math, we're comfortable with all the calculations, could we not just figure this out on our own? Well, you could, but there are some important things that could impact your calculation that you might not be taking into account. Could you give me some examples? Sure. Uh, examples could be, you know, if you had any leave without pays, uh, that could be for maternity or parental leave. It could be for educational leave. Uh, there's several different types of leave that you could have had over your career. And when you come back from those leaves, you would be able to make up any deficiency payments, uh, but you may not have. And then later on, you may be buying back some of that service, uh, but you don't know Exactly. And so because of some of these uh, leaves that you may have had, um, uh, and there could be other breaks in service that you could have had, work interruptions, etc. Uh, it, it's hard to say. So your years of service, you might think you have 15, but you may really only have 13 and a half. So it's always a good idea to check with the pension center to make sure. Yeah, that's really important. I think that also underlines, you know, we talked in earlier sessions why PIPs can't provide you with a pension calculation or estimate. And it's because we don't have access to your personal information. And you need all of those exact numbers down to the decimal, or as you said the other day, John, down to the day and down to the dollar <laughs> in order to make an accurate calculation. And the only folks that really have that is the pension center. That's absolutely right. Uh, we don't have the, the member information. We can provide, you know, back of the napkin type of calculations and we can help members with general questions. But if they want to know uh, about their particular pension, uh, we don't have their salary. So we don't know if their salary is 100,000 or 87,000, et cetera, or their years of service. They, they really do need to go to the pension center and have those things uh, clarified. Right. Um... So we talked about the pension center a little bit. Um, and I think, you know, that lots of folks ask about pension statements and pension um, estimates. Can you give a little bit of background on what that is and why folks maybe haven't seen one of them in a while or ever, depending on when you started with the public service? Yeah, the annual pension statement is, um, is a really good document that used to be sent to everyone uh, it would be as at December 31st, and you would have received it sometime between June and August. And it would have given you um, what the value of your pension is, the transfer value. It would have given you uh, what your retirement is expected to be at your normal retirement age and early retirement. It would have given you your disposal information. It was a really uh, great piece of information. However, uh, Phoenix came around and the pension center ran all the statements and because of the information from Phoenix, uh, everything was <clears throat> all over the place. And so they decided not to send it out. Uh, no one thought it would have taken this long to get Phoenix under control. Uh, there is talk that maybe at the end of this year that uh, statements would be sent again. So you'll be getting them next year. But in the meantime, because of uh, 
what's happened with Phoenix, you're not receiving your annual pension statement. And this is why we always say it's a really good idea for members to call the pension center, make sure that the pension center has their correct information, you know, like their, um, uh, the correct birth date, their, uh, their marital status, et cetera. And, and also to get a pension estimate. So you have an idea of what your pension is so you can do some uh, retirement plan. Okay, that's great. So the information is still available. And I've heard that um, you can sort of get multiple estimates if you wanna compare different scenarios. Like if I want to retire at 55 or 60 or 65, is that true? Uh, absolutely. You'll be able to get uh, you know two estimates so you can compare. Um, you could also check to see if you have any buyback room available. And, um, and you can check to see how much greater would your pension be if you buy back that time. And then you'll be able to see if it's worthwhile to do so. Okay, that's great. So I think, you know, we've established how important it is to contact the uh, pension center, but I think it's still really important for our, our members to have a general understanding of that calculation, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Members, uh, it's very helpful if you understand uh, how your pension plan works and um, how the formula works, uh, very important. Right, and it's helpful too in considering sort of the different things that you're doing throughout your career. If you're coming back from a leave and they give you the option to pay back that deficiency, it can have an impact on your pension. So these are little things that if you sort of understand the big picture, it can help um, you make informed decisions all the way along. Absolutely. All right, so I'm gonna move on to our question period. I know that we've thrown a lot of information at you and I can see that questions are coming in fast and furious as per always. Um, so we're gonna take some of those now. I'll remind folks, if you do have a question for John, please type it into the chat box. My colleague, Catherine is helping us manage those and I will ask them to, to John. So the first question I have comes from Vivek. Um, and they're asking something that I think is on the mind of a lot of folks, given sort of the situation uh, following, I don't quite want to say following COVID-19 because it's still very much ongoing, but <laughs> given that we've had a pretty significant pandemic, um, their question is, does the federal deficit give the government of Canada the opportunity to dip into the pension fund to pay that off? Okay, so that, that's a good question. The answer is no. Uh, the government did that once before, of course, uh, back in the 90s when they scooped part of the surplus. Uh, there was a huge court case that went to the Supreme Court. Uh, and even though, even though the bargaining agents lost that, um, some positive change came out of it. Uh, first was that uh, going forward, the, the court said that the uh, government wouldn't have access to that surplus. And second was that it created the Public Service Pension Investment Board, uh, which is an arm's length uh, institution from the government. So they can't tell them what to do and they, they don't have access to that money. The Public Service Pension Investment Board actually has the money uh, and invests the money for the pension plan. Okay, that's very helpful and probably eases uh, the minds of a few folks on today's webinar. Uh, my next question comes from Linda. The formula for calculating your pension always refers to salary. Does this mean the same thing as gross income? Um, is it gross or net, I guess is what she's asking there. Yeah. So it is your, your gross income and it's, uh, it doesn't include certain things. Uh, like it doesn't include overtime, but it does include bilingual bonus. Uh, and so when you are calling the pension center for an estimate, you have to make sure that uh, if you have any of these uh, additional things to your pay that you ask them and that they take that into account. Um, they know what's pensionable and what isn't pensionable. There's a long list of about 50 different items that are pensionable or, or are not pensionable. Uh, so, but it is the gross amount of uh, your salary. So if you look at your collective agreement and it said, you know, 87,000, uh, that's the number that they would be using for that particular year if you work the whole year. Okay, that's great. My next question comes from Rani, and they're asking, what's the best time of year for retiring? Your birthday, the new year, beginning of the month, end of the month, and so on. 
Okay, so there's really no good time in the year to retire. Uh, every time is good. It really depends on when you want to retire. And for some people, that could be the, their birth month or uh, the month in which they started working, but it doesn't really matter. Um, the reason why people think it matters is because of indexing. Uh, but the next year, so if you retire, for example, in March, uh, next year in January, you'll get indexing, but not for the whole year because you were only retired for nine months this year. And so you would get three quarters of uh, whatever the indexing rate is. And if you retired in January, you get the full rate. And if you retired in December, you wouldn't, you know, so it's all prorated. Uh, but there is an important, uh, there is a best time of the month. And that's always to retire in the second half of the month because if you work 10 days in a month, and that could even be vacation days, uh, you get benefits for that month. And if you decide to take post-retirement benefits, well, they only start the month after you retire. So if you were to retire in March and you retired March 1st, uh, you want to get benefits for March and your, your uh, post-retirement benefits would only start in April. So any fees that you had in March wouldn't be covered. And this is why we say always retire towards the end of the month. So that way you get your benefits paid. There's no uh, hiccups in between. Uh, but you might not want to get, um, you might not want to retire on the last day of the month because if that is a holiday, like New Year's Day or a, a weekend, then that pushes you to the first of the following month. So you have to be aware of that. Okay, that's really helpful. Uh, my next question comes from Sema. Um, and they're wondering, does any leave without pay that you take affect your pension calculation? So even when they're whether we're talking about a few hours to do volunteer work, say with the union or with any other organization, does every little bit of leave without pay make a difference? So uh, potentially, yes. Um, certain leave without pays, uh, like if you're doing union work or something, um, you're paid for that period. So there's not a problem, okay? But if you uh, took, uh, for example, you went on maternity leave for a year and you didn't pay that back, uh, the deficiency back upon your return, and you'd have twice the amount of time to pay back uh, that maternity leave, um, then you're missing that one year. And that, that can make a big uh, difference when it comes to uh, potentially early retirement or retar having a bigger pension. And if you don't, decide, if you don't pay it back upon your return, uh, then you'd have to buy it back later on. And when you buy it back later on, um, is that the salary at that time, not the salary that you had while you're on the leave? And there's also a penalty of interest charges, et cetera. So it's always very important uh, for our members when they come back from a leave, uh, maternity, parental, education, et cetera, to uh, learn about how they can pay back uh, that deficiency as soon as possible. Okay. All right. That's very helpful. My next question comes from... Aminal, uh, Donna, and uh, several folks, frankly. Um, does the pension get an annual inflation rate for the cost of living or does it, whatever you get when you retire, you get that same dollar amount for the rest of your life? Well, uh, there, is an, uh, there is indexing. Uh, right now it's not capped. And, uh, and that's because inflation has been so low for the last number of years. Um, so last year, the uh, inflation uh, rate index was only 1%. So members uh, in January 1st got a 1% increase from the year before. Um, and the year before that, it was 2%. So it's, they've been very low, but certainly there's talk about inflation coming. And, uh, and this is where uh, indexing uh, becomes much more uh, important and effective because otherwise you would lose your purchasing power. Next question comes from Rizmina. If you were working for the government before 2013, left, and then came back, say, in September 2014, which group would you be in? So uh, more than likely, you would be in group two because you left, especially if you took your money out of the pension fund. However, if you left, uh, for example, on some type of leave for a while, uh, that, of course, wouldn't matter if you're on disability or anything. But if you actually terminated an employment and you left your uh, your pension, a deferred pension with the pension center, 
then upon your return, uh, then it's a gray area. I'm not 100% sure. But if you took your money out, then you're definitely a group two member when you come back. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, so the next question from, comes from Galena. How are the years of service calculated? So for example, if I started working in July, will the years be calculated from July to July, which means I need to retire in July in order to have a full year of service? How does that work? Well, they actually calculate your service to the day. Um, and so if you started in July, um, they don't like they just look at your overall service and then they subtract any parts that were in there. So for example, uh, if there was ever a strike, uh, like there was back in the 90s for CRA members, they missed about three days. And those three days, uh, because it's a strike, you, they were not be able to pay back that deficiency or even buy it back. So they're, lo they're losing three days. And so they would have to work three days longer to get that 30 years. So they actually calculated to the day. And, um, and then when you contact the pension center and you want to find out how much service you have, uh, you want to make sure that it coincides with your, your actual start date, et cetera. And if there's anything missing, because often for most members, the first six months, they're not in a pension plan. Um, it's only after six months that they're invited into the pension plan and they have to buy, not buy back, but essentially pay back those six months. But most people don't know about that and they don't seem to advertise it. And so then later on becomes a buyback and you're paying it back at your current salary. So for everyone out there, it's a very good idea to call a pension center, find out how much service you have and if you have any buyback room. Uh, and it, they might say, yes, you have that first six months when you started working. Uh, so it's something definitely to look into. Okay. My next question comes from Deborah. What impact will it have on my pension calculation if I work past the age of 65 or past 35 years of service? Okay, so um, the first part, you can work past age 65. Uh, in fact, you can work as long as you want now. There's no rules or laws prohibiting you to, uh, you know, that you can't work. Um, but you cannot be part of a pension plan after you, your, you once you turn 71. So uh, on December 31st of the year you, you are 70, uh, you cannot uh, pass that and continue to be inside a pension plan. So that uh, is a rule by in the Income Tax Act and uh, all pension plans in Canada have to follow that, that law. So there's nothing that really can be done about that. Uh, although PIPS has complained to the Treasury Board because we have many members, especially our scientists, who um, uh, are over age 71 and aren't accruing service. Um, and the other thing is you cannot have more than 35 years of service. So if um, you have 35 years at age 65, you could continue working and you would get the higher salary calculated in your pension but not after age 71. Again, everything stops at age 71. Okay, that's helpful. My next question comes from Tricia. Um, and they're asking for the average maximum consecutive years of service, how is a year defined? Is it based on like the date of your retirement? Does it go from January to December, July to June, March to February. Okay, so they, <laughs> yeah. So again, uh, when it comes to calculating your best uh, five years of salary, uh, mm -hmm. they go to the day. Okay. So um, uh, for most people, it's the last five years, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the last five years and, and they'll go to the day. So uh, sometimes you'll have a, a period where you're making X amount of dollars from um, January to December but for the five-year calculation, they only need it from, you know, September to December. So they prorate that number uh, by how many days you worked in that year. Uh, so they actually go right to the day in, in order to get your best five years of salary. Okay. My next question comes from Paul. Um, 
how does retro pay when collective agreements are implemented impact that accurate pension calculation at the pension center? So his example is that the last collective agreement uh, retro was not accurate. I'm assuming this is a, a Phoenix problem. <laughs> how, how does that all get resolved when it comes to your pension? Uh, so it's partly a Phoenix problem. It's also partly that negotiations took a lot longer uh, to get done. So uh, the pension center, you know, uh, says retire when you want to retire. And so you might retire and it would, it could take still, for example, two years for the collective agreement to be uh, ratified. So um, you may have worked those two years while the collective agreement was still being uh, uh, bargained. And so what happens is you're retiring and say we're using that example of uh, your the salary, it's 100,000 times 15 years you, that you had. So you have your $30,000 pension. Um, but after uh, the ratification, they find out that your average salary really shouldn't have been 100,000. It should have been 106,000. So uh, what's supposed to happen is when this information gets to Phoenix, and Phoenix sends you the pay for those two years because you weren't working and you were retired, you have to get that back pay. Uh, when that happens, Phoenix is also supposed to tell the pension center and so that the pension center would recalculate your pension. So once you get your back pay, if you haven't heard anything from the pension center, it would be a good idea to call them and say, by the way, uh, there's been a collective agreement that was ratified. I have received my back pay from Phoenix from a pay center, but you haven't still recalculated my pension. And then they'll go and check to make sure with the pay center, and then they'll redo your pension calculation, and they'll send you a lump sum for what you what they should have paid you for the last two years, and then continue paying you at the higher rate. So uh, it can be a little bit of a hassle, but uh, you won't, you're not cheated in the end. You, you get what you're supposed to. Okay, that's, uh, that's really good information. Uh, my next question comes from Catherine. How can we find out where our pension in, is invested? Okay, uh, well, the pension is invested in a lot of things because it's like $160 billion. Um, so if you were to go to the uh, website of the uh, Public Service Pension Investment Board, PSPID, um, you'll be able to see their, their goals, their values, their ESG statement, and um, and also what they're invested in. You might not be able to drill down for everything, but you'll be able to see their large investments uh, and they're invested all around the world. They even have offices in London, New York, Hong Kong. And um, yeah, so they're everywhere. All right. My next question comes from Anna. Um, and they're asking, do we still get the bridge benefit if we apply for CPP at age 60, assuming they're a group one member? Yeah, if you're a group one member and you retire at age 60, the bridge is automatic. Okay, the pension center automatically pays you that bridge benefit to age 65. So if you were to retire, for example, at age 63, then you would only get the bridge benefit from 63 to 65. You do not get like five years. Uh, you know, so if you retired after age 65, you wouldn't get it at all. So it's from age 60 to 65. CPP is a different pension plan altogether or QPP. And you could apply for that anytime after age 60. You incur a penalty, but you can receive both at the same time. All right. Um, and we're getting close to the end of question periods, but I am gonna take a couple more questions. Uh, the next one comes from Joseph and a few folks actually. Um, is your vacation leave payout included as pensionable earnings? I guess when you're doing your calculation. Okay, so if you cash out your uh, vacation, then it wouldn't be included. But if you take your vacation, well then you, you're getting that many more uh, months or days or weeks service and also at that salary. So if it's like, uh, your high salaries at the end and you had three months vacation saved up uh, some people like taking that in a lump sum and that is one option and another option would be to take uh, take three months vacation because that would give you then 
uh, a little bit harder pension because of your higher salary at the end of your career if you happen to be in, in that situation. Um, mm -hmm. But if you could take it out in a cash lump sum, then it wouldn't be uh, calculated in your pension. Okay. My next question comes from Winnie. Uh, you mentioned before that the first six months after joining the public service is not pensionable. Is that just for group two? Is it for everyone? Who does that impact? Uh, okay, so to be clear, it's not that it's not pensionable. It's that you probably weren't in the pension plan. And so it would be everyone. Most members, when they're hired, aren't put into the pension plan immediately. It is something that uh, PIPS has also brought to the attention of Treasury Board saying that in many provinces, you would be put into the pension plan immediately, but in this, in this plan, it's not the case. And, um, and so calling to find out, and group one, group two, it doesn't make any difference uh, to see you know, if you were or if you weren't. If you weren't, you know, to pay back those six months, the sooner, uh, the less expensive it'll be for you. My last question I have from Savas, and I, I know I've seen it come up in the chat a lot, is around um, benefits after the member has deceased. So does your PSP go to your spouse or to your children, or does it stop altogether after you pass away? Okay, so if you're married, uh, your pension uh, is survivor benefit, which is 50%, will go to your spouse immediately. And your spouse would, could be, you know, like married or common law, same sex, it, it doesn't matter, as long as uh, you have the, the information and uh, the proof with the pension center. Um, and it's 50% of your benefit at that time. And for, uh, there are provisions for dependents, I think only though if they're under the age of 21, but I'm not 100% certain of that. Uh, but there are some provisions for uh, dependents. Now there's another thing called the Supplementary Death Benefit or SDB. Uh, that's a benefit that can go to anyone. So it could go to your spouse or uh, son, daughter, you know, whoever. And that would be two times your salary if you were to pass away uh, while you were working. And after you retire, then it depends on a schedule and if you continue to contribute into it. So that's one of the questions that retirees get when they're retiring. Uh, do they want to continue another supplementary death benefit? But to answer the question, the question, uh, there is a survivor benefit, fifty percent, to your eligible spouse. Spouse, and that continues until they pass away. Until they correct? pass away, correct? Okay. Okay, great. Thank you so much um, to everyone for those super awesome questions, and to John for your expertise. Did you have any final comments you'd like to share with folks? Uh, no, I, I really appreciate the good questions. Uh, I can see that members are really interested and that uh, that's fantastic. Um, and I look forward to uh, uh, doing this again soon. Thank you. Awesome. Um, and I'll just remind folks that if we didn't get to your question today, don't sweat it. We ask that you send us an email to bettertogether at pips.ca and you'll see that um, email in the chat soon and it'll be on the slides as well. So don't worry about memorizing it. Um, but send us an email there and our team will be happy to help you out. All right, so let's take a look at some resources. We want to make sure that you have everything you need to find that pension calculation. So as we mentioned earlier, your absolute best resource for the most accurate personal pension statement and estimate is the pension center. They have all of your information, your salary information, your years of service and so on. Your call center is fantastic. The staff are really helpful. You can give them a call from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. your local time, Monday through Friday. Always be sure to have your personal record identifier or PRI handy when you call because their wait times are generally quite short. Also, within your compensation web applications or CWA, there is a calculator that will help you estimate your pension benefit. We still recommend the Pension Center for that super accurate information, but this tool can be handy for quick calculations if you're just sort of imagining different scenarios. As we noted before, PIPS does not have access to your personal pension information, so we can't calculate or estimate your pension. What our team can help you with is understanding how your plan works, understanding those pension statements or communications you're getting from your employer or the Pension Center. 
We also have a lot of great content on our web website, excuse me, and that includes links to Treasury Board's pension information. The Treasury Board's website should be your first stop when you're looking for that general information about your pension. Then when you're looking for that personal information about your pension, that's when you call the Pension Center. All right, so let's recap. Today, following a quick review of the pension plan and how it works, we took a look at how to calculate your pension benefit. We took a look at what we call our guideline and compared that to the actual calculation. We went over some things you should consider when calculating your pension and connected you with the best resources for understanding your pension calculation. All right, so we do have another opportunity for feedback. And once again, these feedback polls are completely anonymous and optional. Results will not be shared with participants, but your participation does help us continue to improve your webinar experience. You should be seeing, oh, there we go, <laughs> three questions on your screen now. The first question, on a scale from one to five, with one being terrible and five being excellent, please rate your overall webinar experience. The second question, did you find this webinar informative? Excuse me. And the third and final question is, how did you feel about the level of detail provided about the public service pension plan during this webinar? And I'll once again remind folks, if you don't see the pop-up, it's just likely due to some computer settings. Um, so don't sweat it. You are welcome to share your responses in the chat, but I will note that any information shared in the chat is not anonymous. I'll give folks a little bit more time to respond to that question. All right. So thank you very much for your feedback and your participation in the poll. And with that, we are at the end of our session. Thank you again for joining us. I want to thank John for his expertise and to Catherine for her support in the chat box and during our question period. I'll remind folks once again, if you have any outstanding questions about this presentation, our campaign to protect pensions, or frankly, anything at all, send us an email to bettertogether at pips.ca and we'll make sure that your message gets to the right member of our team so you get the information you're looking for. Again, thank you so, so much and I hope you have a wonderful day.